All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today is going to be our last module day for data structures. And what we're going to be talking about today is going to be whiteboarding problems and the technical interview process. Um, so the purpose of this lecture, more well, this lecture is going to be more of a discussion than anything. Uh, but the purpose of this lecture is to give us the tools necessary to be able to succeed uh, in a technical interview. We're going to be breaking down lead code. And we're going to be talking about the expectations that you should have whenever you're out there uh, searching for a job and going through the interview process with a tech company. Um, with that said, does anyone have any questions over the topics that we'll be covering today? Okay, if there are no questions, let's go ahead and kick it off. So it looks like the first thing we're going to do is talk about Lee code, uh, cover its capabilities and limitations. So let's go into that here. This is leak code. How do we use it and why? Let me try to zoom in a little bit. That should be a good enough font for everyone. Um, so here in leak code, we can see on the right hand side, I have a code editor. Uh, it's saying my test case passed because I have some code here before. If I run this now, it's gonna tell me that all of them fail because they're not doing anything. Um, so here we have my solution class. I have a problem named to sum, and I'm currently just pass, um, passing in the pass keyword into this method of my class. Um, we can see that here on the right hand side, not only is this code editor, uh, essentially just a code editor for me specifically, um, but you'll notice that there's specific shortcuts that are no longer available here, right? I can't um expect leak code to give me the same um the same shortcuts that i used to get from my vs code they're no longer available here inside of leak code and the purpose of leak code is very much to get you prepared for an interview problem um with that said it's not going to give you the tools that vs code gives you it's not going to allow you to have any sort of extensions that will help you come up with a solution. And it's meant to push you and uh, meant for you to solidify your knowledge in the specific language that you're using. Uh, when you step inside of a, of a technical interview, most of the time the interviewer is gonna allow you to choose whichever language you feel most comfortable with, unless they explicitly tell you, um, hey, we want you to use this language, in which case make sure you utilize that language. But here, when I come to leak code, I can see, or we've seen over the, the time that we cover data structures, that leak code usually pops up Python as our default. Well, if we wanted to change the language, we could click on this Python 3 icon right on the code, and it brings up all the other languages that are available for me to utilize if I wanted to change my language. So for example, if I wanted to do this in JavaScript, it would very quickly change my function into a JavaScript function. Uh, but I want to make sure I stick with Python 3, since that's what we've been working with so far, and it's still utilizing classes and methods. So that's the code editor and the ability to change languages. Does anyone have any questions over that so far? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, just one thing that I wasn't uh, a super fan of in this is right you can you can run it and you can test uh you can you can test your attempts or whatever but then it's going to access all the classes and then it's going to give you whether or not you would have passed but i didn't really see a way that you can go in there and just like you know just do a couple test lines to make sure that it's working as you want like i end up every time i do lead code i ended up doing a repl it in another window just so i can just like test my individual logic within there is there uh is there some way to do that or are you just pretty much like if you don't know the exact syntax and get it in there to where it's uh the way it needs to be you're just kind of uh unable to to test pieces yeah it's a great question um so what mike is referencing to is if i have print statements somewhere in my code but later on my code happens to raise an error um, my print statements won't actually show up on my log Instead, all it's going to tell me is, hey, there's an error on this line, but it's not going to allow me to see my print statement logic that I have before to be able to see individual sections of what I'm doing. Um, not only that, but it, like we said, it won't give me hints as to what the proper syntax would be whenever I'm running my code or writing my code in general. So when it comes to problems like these, 
uh, most of the time you're going to want to ask the interviewer, hey, are you, is if I have any questions regarding syntax or regarding my problem, am I allowed to uh, use Google or draw it out on the whiteboard or stuff, uh, use external resources to kind of figure out my code? Or do you want me to ask all questions directly towards you? And the interviewer will likely tell you, hey, uh, utilize me as if I was the internet. Any questions that you have regarding syntax or anything like that, you can ask me. Uh, but as far as leak code goes, if you have an error in your code, it won't show you any of your print statements or sections. So it's important that you consistently run your code after every small step that you take. That way, after every small step, you can see some print statements, confirm that the code is working the way you want it to, and then afterwards change it to do a um, change it to complete the behavior for the entire problem. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yes, thank you. Of course. All right. So moving on from here, we can see that we have this problem, sum of two numbers. And let's say that I wanted to run some code and I wanted to figure this information out. Well, before I even start writing code and um, start thinking about how to solve this problem, I have to make sure that I know what the problem is. So can I get somebody to read this problem out loud, please, for the class? Okay, I got it. Given an array of integers, nums, and an integer target, return indices of the two numbers such that they add up to target. You may assume that each input would have exactly one solution, and you may not use the same element twice. You can return the answer in any order. All right, great. So it sounds like all I need to do is grab the, the indexes of the numbers, the two numbers, which would add up to the target. So here we see an example where 2 plus 7 would equal 9, so it returns 0 and 1. Uh, we get another example where the target is six, and we can see that it returns index one and two, which is two and four. And then we can see that we got six, which is zero and zero. Okay, so you can return the answer in any order. That's good to know. Uh, you may assume that each input would have exactly one solution. So the, I'm not accounting for any empty list or manipulating any empty list or anything like that. So right now what I'm doing is reading through this and making sure that I am taking care of any edge cases, right? I know there's going to be one solution every time, so I don't have to account for there not being a solution, and I don't have to account for an empty list within, uh, within my parameters. So now that I know that, I can start writing some code. And before I write any code, I always want to make sure that I write some pseudocode. So there's a note down at the bottom that we won't talk about just yet, um, but we will stay up in here. All right, so here we see our constraints. Um, it's letting us know what the length of the list would be. It's letting us know that the first index of a number or any index of this, um, of this list won't have anything less than negative 10 to the power of nine, and it won't have anything greater than 10 to the power of nine. And it will let me know that it's the same process for my targets. And I apologize, everyone. I got a little bit of background noise coming in. Can everyone hear that? Or is everyone good with my audio? Yeah, it's got some feedback or reverb or something. Yes, I apologize. All right. Okay, let me go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take a short break here while this this uh, leaf blower passes by. So currently right now it is 9.10. Let's come back at 9.15 and continue on with our lecture. I apologize, everyone. All right, welcome back, everyone. Again, I apologize for that small interruption. Uh, but now we're going to go ahead and start writing some code. But before I even start writing any code, I'm going to start serial coding what I want to do. Well, we know that the end goal is that I want to iterate through the list and find the two numbers or the two indexes that would add up to the target. So iterate through list and find two indexes 
that add to target. So it sounds like I would want to do an iteration through the first loop and I would want to compare current number with nums in remaining lists. And this says that I should only account for one solution. So that tells me that upon finding a pair that adds up to target, I can kill and return the function, the answer. Okay, so the first part, let's iterate through the list. So let's do four num idx in enumerate. And what I'm going to do is enumerate through nums. And now let me go ahead and print num and idx to make sure that that part is working correctly. So now I'm running it. I can see I got zero and two. Oh, it looks like I got those two backwards. So num is representing the index. So I got to switch these two around. So I want idx and num, idx and num. Now I can make sure my variable namings actually show up something. So now I can see zero and two, one and seven, two and 11. So this is working correctly. Uh, but now what I want to do is I want to enumerate through the remaining of the list. So now I'm going to say four JDX and sub num, because this is the sub number that I'm checking in enumerate, and I don't want to double check numbers that I've checked before. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually slice my list so that it only checks any remaining numbers afterwards. Okay, now what I can do is I can print num and sub num so I can make sure that this is working. Okay, so we can see that it goes two and it compares it with two. Uh, let's see, my list is two, seven, 11. Okay, so it looks like the first number is inclusive, which is not necessarily what I want. I don't want it to return um, two and have it to double check against itself since we know that's not possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and add one there. I'm gonna run my code one more time to make sure that's working. Okay, so now we can see it compares two, then it goes against seven, against 11, against 15, moves on to seven, against 11, against 15, moves on to 11 and checks against 15. And then after that, there's not any other numbers. So it kills my, it kills my method. All right, great. I was able to reiterate through my list. I got all of my subnums and all of my uh, possible combinations are being checked for. Well, now I know that once I find the target, I can just return my uh, statement. So I can say if num plus subnum is equal to target, then I can return idx and jdx. Okay, so now let's run this. See what I get. Okay, it seems like I get a little bit of a problem here, and that's because I'm using the enumerate function, I believe. Because I'm lit, I'm cutting my list, so it's not lo not longer, uh, no longer working correctly. Huh. Let's see. What else can I do here? 
Well, it looks like the enumerate function isn't the right answer then, if I'm using it this way. It might work for my first loop, but it wouldn't work for my secondary loop. So maybe my secondary loop is going to have to be a range. So let's check that now. I'm going to take num still. I'm going to go ahead and slice it. Um, so I could start JDX at one, uh, but by starting, um, sorry. So David asked a question on the chat. He's saying, can you start JDX at one like you would in JS? Um, so if I were to start JDX at one, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be adaptive to what's happening up here, right? I want to make sure that I slice the list so that I'm not checking numbers over and over again, I'm not duplicating the numbers that I'm checking. So instead, I'm going to check IDX, and then JDX will be one more than whatever IDX is currently at. And I can say that subnum is equal to nums at JDX. OK, so now if I run this, this should return the answer that I want. Nope. No, I won't because I forgot to do that. No, because that wouldn't work either. All right. Yeah, it wouldn't work either. I see a question there, uh, Brian, which, yeah, that would handle the first one, but it wouldn't handle it if my numbers were in different spots. So maybe all of this has to be done with a range function, right? And we can simulate something that we would do in, in JS. So for IDX and range, um, len nums, and then we can say num is equal to nums in uh, IDX. And then for IDX, Yeah, this would work. We would just have to not slice it anymore. Let's see what that does now. It's going to check repetitive numbers, uh, but that's okay. We can check it later on. Okay, we can see that it prints out three and three. Okay, so I want to make sure that it's not repetitive. Okay, if I add a plus one, that's going to throw something like list index out of range, I believe. Okay, so it tells me, hey, there's a list index out of range. Uh, so I could do something like checking for an if statement where I can say if um we might be able to like idx plus jdx if we wanted i'm not sure yeah i'm gonna go through that once i go into the refactoring adam. process adam uh, apologies all right so now i can say if jdx plus one is less than the length of nums then I would want this to happen, right? And now I can say sub num is equal to the nums JDX. Okay, so let's see what it's doing now. Okay, so it looks like it's able to, pra to pass one. 
and actually it's not passing one at all. It's expecting one and two, but it's failing. It passed the first one. But now when I check my second one, it's saying it failed because it's returning zero and zero rather than returning two and four. Okay, so something in here is being repeated. So we can see that IDX is happening here. We can see JDX. Oh, we forgot to add the one there. Okay, now it all fails. And you know, the more I keep messing around with this, the more I'm gonna realize, oh, well, maybe I'm going about this all wrong. Maybe this isn't the way that I wanna do my code here. So let's check what else I can do in my range, my range function, right? We got nums and nums is okay. Uh, but maybe I could account for this plus one within the range. So let's comment that out. I can see that I can get my nums and it's happening within IDX. But what does this range function do? This range function can take in where they should start and where it should end. So I can tell it that what I wanted to start at I plus one, or sorry, at IDX plus one, but I still want it to end at the length of nums. So now it's no longer starting at zero, it's starting at one, All right? So now I can go ahead and say, I'm not gonna need this if statement anymore because it's accounting for the end. I can uncomment this code here. Okay, and now we can see that subnum should just be JDX because I don't have to worry about adding one. We're doing it at the range level. And now let's see what happens with my code. Well, now we can see two, seven, 11, 15, nine, and it's able to return the actual, um, the actual print statements that I want, right? Let's check case two. Case two is able to iterate through three and two three and four, two and four, and so on. So I was actually able to find my uh, my solution. This is a working solution. Now, there's a couple of issues here. Let's go ahead and break this down, right? And this is, this is a good conversation that you could have with an interviewer. Now you wanna go ahead and refactor your code, right? I make this variable named nums IDX. Um, now the level at which I made it at, seems appropriate, right? I'm not making it within the nested for loop. It's happening at the parent level. So it's only happening as many times as it needs to. And it's not happening repeatedly if I don't actually need it. And then I make this sub nums, but do I even need these variables at all? No, you're just at the end of the day, you just want to compare IDX and JDX. Like instead of num sub num equals target, you should be able to do just if um, nums of I plus nums of J equals target. Nice. Right, so I could do something like if nums of IDX is equal to nums of JDX. And if that's equal to the target, right? Okay, and I can't really do a itinerary statement there because if I do return, that's gonna kill my function. So I wanna make sure that I keep it this way. And it seems like I was able to cut down a bit on my on my length here. Uh, there's also another time that I use a little bit of under the hood stuff, which is LEN, but that doesn't occupy enough space for me to actually consider this. Um, but we can see how through trying different approaches, I was able to come up with this solution. Right, I ran into a bit of a bug and I tried making that bug work over and over again. Now, sometimes when you're inside of the interview process, you're gonna find yourself doing that. Uh, you know, you, there's somebody interviewing you, um, you're working with a problem that you know should be fairly simple and that you should be able to come up with a solution to, and you just get stuck in this one-way mentality, right? And let's say that you guys were the interviewers in this case, 
very quickly, David reached out on the chat and said, hey, maybe there's something that we can do to mimic the same thing as in JavaScript, um, where we can change the index of JDX and make it into one, right? And I... I read it out loud and I still ignored it and I continued to go through the same process. Well, sometimes that happens when you're working with an interviewer. The interviewer is going to prompt you or give you a hint. Hey, there's probably a better way to do this. Or, hey, you're going about this the wrong way. Maybe you should think about it in X, Y, and Z. Um, but you just get stuck in that mentality. It's very important that you listen to the interviewer. The interviewer is there to help you. They're not there to necessarily just challenge you and uh, show you all of your deficiencies. They're there to guide you through the problem because they don't necessarily uh, want to just see you provide some code. They want to see your way of thinking, your ability to communicate, and your ability to refactor and listen to the rest of the team. All right. So now I'm passing this, the test results down here. I got the and, three. Pages. Oh, sorry. And so, oh, sorry. Can I throw in one thought real quick? Of course. Thank you. Uh, just to add on to your point about what you were saying about the interviewer looking to sort of guide you and, and help and mentor. Um, speaking from experience doing mock interviews with students, there have been times where maybe I've asked someone a question to confirm my understanding. And then that person kind of started second guessing themselves. And they were actually on a good path, but then ended up going on a less good path while working on the problem. And so while I didn't do it on purpose, you know, earlier when I threw out a suggestion in Francisco, you were like, hey, actually, I, I want to get this done and then we can look at that. That That's um, a great skill to have in, in interviews and something to, to bear in mind, too, that the interviewer isn't like the all-knowing uh, expert. Awesome. All right. So now moving on with our lesson, we were able to do this, um, but we don't necessarily get any any good feedback just yet, all I can see is that I passed three test cases. All right, well, what's the value behind lead code if this is all it's doing? I could write a test suite in Python on VS code and see that my code is running successfully. So why would I even bother with this platform? Well, what happens when I click the submit button? Let's see, so now I'm submitting. It's telling me that it's judging me, um, which is a little concerning, but all right. Um, and now I can see here that it gives me a bit of an analysis on the left-hand side. It tells me, hey, you passed all the test cases. It, it was all accepted. And I think at somewhere it tells me, okay, it doesn't tell me. And then it tells me how many people my solution beats. So my solution took 1,695 milliseconds to actually run. And in memory, it occupies 17.34 megabytes. So it's giving me a runtime analysis and a memory analysis. So here's my big O, my time analysis, my time complexity, and here's my memory analysis. Okay, great. Well, if I take a look at runtime, it's telling me it's taking a long time and it only beats 24.72 of the other solutions that have been provided, which means I'm not really beating a lot of people. In high insight, what kind of big O is this? What What is my solution right now? Go ahead, Brian. N squared. Yeah, right now I have a, a O of N squared, right? It's, I have a nested loop and instead of running in linear time, I'm running squared, but this is the more input that I have, the more time it will take for my solution to um, to actually compile. But when we look at the memory analysis and memory, I didn't use almost any variables. Um, I was able to just reference nums and target. And essentially the only two variables that I made were that I made were IDX and JDX. I could probably cut a little bit more memory usage if I were to um, summarize this length function a little bit, uh, but it, the, it wouldn't be enough to where it would move me by much as far as my memory space. So now that I know this information, oh, I have a question. Give me a second here before, uh, once I move into my transition point, I'll go back to you, Will. Um, now that I know this information, well, I can probably challenge myself and go back, take a look at the problem, 
And how we can scoot down to the bottom, we can see that there's a like follow up here, right? And that follow up is asking me, can you come up with an algorithm that is less than O of n squared time complexity? So I didn't read this all the way. And I did that on purpose because this is part of the lecture, right? Now, if I come back and I read this, I can say, oh, wow, well, maybe there's a way that I can do this without going into O of n squared. All right, go ahead, Will. Uh, yeah, so I, I noticed that a lot of times the memory and the time it takes to run the code is usually like uh, the opposite. So like, uh, what do interviewers uh, look at? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question, Will. Um, so Will's question is, you know, we know he noticed that whenever you run your code, it's usually the opposite. So what he means is if you have a really efficient algorithm that has a really good runtime, well, then it's a pretty there's a pretty good chance that your memory space analysis is pretty bad, where your memory space occupies way more than what it needs. And we saw that a perfect example of that when we were talking about uh, linear search versus binary search, right? Linear search is very simple. You just do a for loop, you check what condition in there, and once you find that condition, you return a value. It kills it immediately. It doesn't use much memory. It's not creating any variables. But when we do binary search, binary search has to find the bottom and the largest, and then after that, it has to cut down each time, occupying that memory space over and over again and changing its value, and then doing an analysis to check if it meets the conditions. So um, remember that something that's efficient in runtime doesn't necessarily mean that it's also efficient in memory. And the same can be said vice versa. Uh, what they're looking for is something that can provide um, a good balance, right? You want the best out of both worlds. If you can find something that's, uh, you know, beating 75% in runtime and beating 75% in memory space, then that's the solution that you want. As long as you can find a good balance between them, then you're great. Or sometimes it's just not possible to find a good balance between them. Sometimes you just have to choose runtime over memory. And sometimes you have to choose memory over runtime. But most of the time, um, we would want everyone to concentrate on that runtime portion. Does that answer your question, Will? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Of course. Okay. So now at this time, everyone should have the link to the two sums. If you do not have the link to the two sums, I'm going to go ahead and share the link here on Zoom. So here on Zoom, you have the link. I will also share it on the Whiskey channel just in case everyone needs it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take the, the class and we're going to break up. I'll open up the breakout rooms. And what I would want everyone to do is refactor this code that we currently have here and see if you can find an answer that works more efficiently than O of N squared. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause this recording. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope everyone had a good time figuring out how to do this in uh, log of N. Oh, and I just totally showed everyone my answer, which was not the plan. All right, <clears throat> so, now let's go ahead and uh, break this problem down. Let's see what code we had before. Well, if I go into the whiskey channel, I can grab my previously written code. And I want to figure out how I can make this code more efficient. How is it that this code can become something that isn't O of N squared? Well, what if I just want it to be O of N, right? I just wanted to iterate one time. How could I check that? What are the two things that I truly need to know to be able to solve this problem? Right, I need to keep track of my index and the number belonging to that index. Those are the two things that I actually need to keep track of um, in order to be able to solve this. So that sounds like a key value pair. So key value pair where the key is num and the value is my index. Okay, well, that's great, but how, does, how do I keep track of that? And 
check for my indexes here. Well, we know I'm not going to want this nested for loop. So I can erase that, erase that, and erase that. OK, so I'm only going to have one loop where I'm going to create a key value pair. OK, so I'm going to say uh, num index dictionary. That's just going to be a dictionary that's going to carry all my key and value pairs. Well, now it says compare the number with the nums in remaining list. Well, I don't want to do that anymore, right? So maybe what I want to do is I want to check how much I need to find my answer. Difference. between my current number and target. After I get that information, I can check if that difference is within the dictionary. And if it is, then I should return that target. All right, so I can return an answer. And if it isn't, then I can add current number and index into dictionary. All right, so that's currently my code. That's what I'm going to try to uh, try to attempt. So first, I have my difference. And what I'm going to make that equal to is going to be to my target minus my nums. Okay, so that's gonna give me the difference between them. Now, all I need to do is I need to check if difference is in my current dictionary because that's going to give me the value. Well, if it is, then I can return IDX, comma, and then the dictionary itself at the key of difference. And if it is not within my dictionary, then I can build my dictionary by saying, num idx dick is going to hold my number that I'm currently on at idx. OK, and then we'll, as this is running, I just want to see a print statement for my current dictionary so that I can visualize it. Go ahead, Kara. I'm just wondering if using like in, like on line 11, if that is not looping through the dictionary. That's a good question. Yeah, so when it comes to dictionaries, by utilizing the in keyword, essentially what's happening under the hood is a, uh, it's checking each individual value kind of in a loop per se. So it is under the hood doing an additional loop, uh, but it's not um, happening with a for loop or a while loop. It's, it's a little bit more complex to explain, but this actually won't increase your big O notation. This will keep it at O of N rather than O of N squared. Does that answer your question, Kara? Yeah, it does, thanks. Of course. All right, let's go ahead and run this and see what it's doing. Okay, so it tells me there, hey, there's a problem. Um, I am checking if the difference is in the num IDX 
dictionary. It is. And it's telling me the difference, it does not exist. So I misspelled difference. So let's try that again. Okay. So now it's, yes, I'll cover that right now, Donnie. Um, so now we can see him. We have two and seven, prints out my target. At first, my dictionary is empty. Goes through two. It says, all right, well, two, the difference between two and seven, I mean, between uh, two and nine is seven. It checks if seven is inside of the dictionary. It is not because it is not in the dictionary. It adds two to the dictionary along with the index of zero. Moves on to the next one, which is seven. It goes through, finds the difference between seven and the target is two. Since the difference is two, it checks if two is in the dictionary. It is in the dictionary. So it returns the current index at which I'm at, which is one. And then the index where two is located, which we know is zero. And just like that, I get zero and one or one and zero. We know that the order in which my answer is returned does not matter. We can see it happening here as well. We see the difference between three and six is three. It does not exist, so it adds it to the dictionary. Difference between two and six is four. Four does not exist, so it adds two to the dictionary. Difference between four and six is two. Grabs two, and it returns two and one. All right. Now to answer Donnie's question and to go back to Kara's question, as far as why is this working if in is something that's a um, that's essentially looping. So a dictionary works as a hash map. Uh, we didn't really cover that during our data structures week, uh, but essentially what this means is that it's instant lookup or constant. We talked about constant time, right? It's essentially going to check. It's going to run this line right here just like it would for an index inside of a list. If the index does not exist inside the list, it would return an error and say, hey, the index is out of range. Um, just like as if we try to access a key that does not exist within the list, it would also say, hey, this key doesn't exist. And it would throw an error. It would say this value doesn't exist when I try to run it, right? Well, when you utilize the in keyword, rather than throwing an error, it's just saying, hey, does this return a value or does it not? And that's why it remains in constant time whenever you're utilizing a dictionary. Whereas if this was a list, it would be looping under the hood. Does that answer your question better, Kara? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, awesome. And I think that answered your question as well, Donnie? Yeah. Okay, great. Natalie? Uh, does it make a difference if it was uh, like, your dictionary dot keys? Yes, it does. Uh, so the reason why it makes a difference is because when you utilize the function of dot keys, dot keys actually returns a list. So by turning it into a list, now you're iterating through it and you're uh, putting a nested for loop. Whereas if you're just accessing the dictionary itself, you're doing a constant time lookup. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Yes. Oops. Okay, great. If there are no other questions, we're gonna move on to the next portion of our lecture. Uh, the next portion of our lecture is gonna cover um, how to succeed inside of a technical interview. Uh, here we go. All right, how to succeed, whiteboarding problems. All right, so the interview process. There's The interview process is pretty long. Um, I think, uh, it's like, it's kind of strenuous and I'm not gonna lie. When I was going through it, it was very heartbreaking when you make it, you've been interviewing with the same company for three months. And then all of a sudden in the final interview, you, they tell you like, Hey, sorry, we chose someone else. It's like, it's been three months, man. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. It's not uncommon to have a really long interview process. Um, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. 
Um, the first part of the interview is always going to be your resume screening, right? So we have resume coaches that were offered out to room. We have mentor coaches that can also help you out with your resume. Um, and we have plenty of resources for career services to help out with building up your resume uh, so that you can get past that resume screening, right? Once you get past the resume screening, you get that first interview. Well, first you get the email to schedule that first interview. First interview gets scheduled out and you get your first coding challenge on Lead Code. All right, or something similar to Lead Code. Um, I think the weirdest interview that I've had was where they asked me a coding question. They basically wanted me to make an API endpoint, uh, which we'll learn later on in this course. Uh, but rather than using any code editor or any Lead Code or anything like that, they sent me a link to a Google Doc and they just wanted me to write code on a Google Doc, which is okay, right? It's It's essentially the same thing but just don't be thrown off by utilizing different platforms. Um, I don't want everyone to have a baseline and always expect a code editor because that's not always gonna be the case. Okay, so you get through that coding challenge. Um, once you finish that first coding challenge, then you get the next technical interview. So now the next technical interview, maybe um, it's something where they just wanna talk to you about tech. Maybe they wanna talk about your passions, how you got into tech. Um, the most common one that I see is uh, show me a project that you've worked on and show me a feature that you're really proud of. And then after you show them that feature that you're really proud of, you know, they totally tell you how that feature isn't working efficiently and how um, they point out a couple of weak points about your project. And they ask you, how would you make this better? Uh, they want to see your ability to identify code, take in critique and be able to just refactor your code or at least talk about it in a way where you're not offended when someone tells you that, you know, your, your code isn't cutting the cheese in that point. All right. Then there's technical interview two. So now technical interview two, maybe a conversation again, um, maybe something a little bit more along the lines of, Hey, here's a project. Um, I think the most common ones I've seen is, uh, here's a social media platform. Then it's a, it's supposed to be like a mock project that's supposed to um, resemble some sort of social media like Instagram or Facebook. And then after that, they tell you somewhere in this project, there's a bug or this this specific feature is supposed to happen when you click on this button, uh, but it's not working properly. And then they tell you, find the bug and fix it, or they tell you to develop a new feature for the project, right? And uh, those here, it says that it should take four hours. Um, if I'm being completely honest, they usually give you about a week to two weeks to work on these. And uh, in my experience, I've utilized the week to two weeks at its full potential um, just to try to make sure that I get that I get it all done. Uh, whenever you're working on these projects that you get to take home, they're more than likely going to give you a GitHub uh, repository that they would like you to push all this code into. When you get this GitHub repository, you need to be mindful about the things that you're pushing into the repo. Um, make sure you're not pushing up any secret keys, any um, you know vital information, anything that you wouldn't push up for a regular project. You don't want to push it up on their side as well. You want to make sure that you construct that you construct clear and concise readmes that explain what your code is doing. Um, you want to explain the features that you've included. You want to be as detailed as possible as if it were an actual production uh, level level feature that you're pushing over to them. Um, they want to see all of these things because it tells them how prepared you are, how committed you are to actually working with them and working with their projects. Finally, if you make it through all of these um, first four steps, you'll get the behavioral interview. And the behavioral interview is just be yourself. Um, I feel like sometimes people stress out too much when it comes to the behavioral interview and, uh, you know, they suppress their themselves. I know I had a problem with that. I would go kind of into Marine mode and just start answering questions with a really serious face. And, uh, whenever I would ask for feedback from people after behavioral interviews, it would tell me that I just seemed a little too robotic during the behavioral interview. Um, so just watch out for that. Make sure you're yourself crack a couple of jokes and uh, a small hint is always ask the interviewer what their story is after that's done. People really like to talk about themselves. Um, and for whatever reason, it really like enlightens them when you ask them, hey, you know, like you sound really interesting. Um, I would like to know more about you. Can you tell me what your story is? Like, how did you get here to this point? 
and then you'll see their their face just completely change. Um, their entire demeanor about the entire interview process will change, and they'll start telling you their entire their entire story, which is great. And not only that, but then later on, when they're thinking about it or they're trying to decide their next candidate, they'll they'll have you in their memory because you asked them for their story. All right. And then finally, they will give you the final interview, which is sometimes not technical, sometimes technical. Um, but once you get into that final interview, the main thing to do is concentrate on having good questions for the interviewer. Um, because they already asked, whatever questions that interviewer is going to ask you, they've already asked you before. They just want to reassure themselves that you are the right pick. And the best way to reassure themselves that you are the right pick is by you asking them the proper questions about their company, about their story, because it shows your interest in their company. Does anyone have any questions about the that portion of the background of the interview process? Go ahead, Tyler. Where would you say is like the bottleneck in that in that process or where the most of the weeding out happens? Um, so I would say the most of the weeding out happens at the resume screening. Um, I think that's the the hardest part to actually get your resume through the door. Um, the reason why I say that is because most of the time when you apply through online platforms, they already have some sort of um, bot that goes through your resume and looks for specific keywords. If those keywords aren't inside of your resume, it gets tossed aside. Um, so, you know, look for people that can give you references, um, talk to the alumni channel, go on LinkedIn and talk to people, because if you can get your resume in front of an actual person, then you've made it past the resume screening. That's the only problem with actually running your resume through their system. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. And then after that, I think the next portion at which people really, where the next cutting really happens is the behavioral interview. Does that answer your question, Tyler? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. All right. Okay. Moving on. So now we have the whiteboarding problem and technical interview. So historically, the whiteboarding problem is quite literally in person and they have a huge whiteboard and they expect you to draw out your thought process and uh, draw out the problem and then turn your drawings into code, kind of the same way that we turn our pseudocode into code. Well, a lot of things have changed here. Um, now, most of the time they're done over Zoom. Um, they may ask you to write code, but not run it. Uh, they may ask you to not write code at all. Uh, they may just ask you to pull up, pull up something that you can draw on, something like TL draw, and draw out the problem itself. Or they may just send you a Google Doc and tell you, hey, write this code on this Google Doc. It's not always going to be algorithms-based. I know we concentrated a lot over um, data structures and algorithms this week, but at least from my experience when I was doing the, the when I was doing the interview process and the job hunt, almost all of my questions were project based, where they sent me a project or they told me, hey, we're building an API for that's supposed to do X, Y, and Z. How do you build the API endpoint to this? Or they asked, how does a database actually communicate um, with your backend or what's the full stack flow? They're questions that are more pertaining to what you're actually going to be doing inside of your job rather than concentrating on data structures and algorithms. Um, with that said, that was my experience. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be yours. So please make sure that anything that got taught during this cohort, um, you refresh yourself, you keep it in your back pocket. I know, for example, SQL, as you all will see, our PostgreSQL module is going to be like the one of the lighter modules that we'll teach. And what happened to me when I was a student is I learned Postgres and I was like, well, this is super easy. I don't really need to to refresh myself. And then I applied for a backend job, got my, my foot in the door and got into the technical interview. And my technical interview was to write a SQL query for two join tables. And it had been so long that I, since I did SQL that I completely just, uh, you know, demonstrated my weaknesses in that interview. So please make sure to keep yourself refreshed with all the material as we go through the, through the program. All right, so the purpose of the technical interview, um, the purpose of the technical interview isn't necessarily to see you um, solve the problem as explained before, it's more to see your process. 
how did you get to solving your problem? Um, were you able to communicate with the interviewer? Were you able to talk about your code intelligently? Were you able to actually turn your pseudocode into code and accomplish the mission? Once you were able to come up with a solution, if time allows it, were you able to take feedback in a productive manner and refactor your code to apply that feedback? That's the purpose of the technical interview, not necessarily to just watch you fly through the problem as if the problem didn't exist, All right? Because all that tells the interviewer is, okay, well, you rehearsed the problem enough times that when I asked you, this wasn't the first time you ever saw it. And that's the reason why you were able to finish it so fast. All right. So now we got the succeeding at the whiteboarding problem. Um, the interviewer is not your enemy. They are your ally. Make sure that you ask questions to your interviewer. Um, they are there to help you and guide you to a con to a solution. Again, they don't want to see you just write code. They want to talk to you and see your ability to communicate the problem. Um, one to three days before, always confirm the language they're going to be doing. If you can, get the task that you'll be working on and ask for a name and the role of the people who's interviewing you. Then when you're tackling the problem, make sure that you keep track of your time. Um, don't necessarily set a timer, but just keep time in the back of your head. Um, that way you're always doing this constant check-ins at ten, every 10 minutes of checking in, asking the interviewer how you're doing in, in time, um, saying out loud so you're stuck is never a bad idea if you are stuck because you know if you are stuck and the interviewer sees oh well we're running out of time but i want to see how they solve this portion of the problem they may tell you or give you a hint as to how to move forward so they can really observe the part that they're looking for and always repeat the question back all right once you're done reading the question repeat it back to them make sure you're looking for any edge cases ask the interviewer if there are any edge cases that you need to consider that you might have missed and uh, make sure you do any clarifying or anything that you think might be fuzzy regarding the question. You want to make sure that you have that all smoothed out before you start the interview process. All right. And then fully understand what the algorithm fu function is expecting out of you. Just cover that. After that, start with the easiest possible solution or the easiest possible input and output of the of the problem. Now, you want to start off with easy and then slowly make your program grow. Um, there's been plenty of times where I've seen people try to just consider all edge cases, consider all possible input from the very start because they want to write clean, uh, clean code. But the refactoring process is there for a reason. Start off as simple and uh, um, as simple as possible. Write dirty code, make as many variables as you need to make in order to make sure that your code is working properly. Then after that, go back, refactor, decide which one of those variables you don't need, get rid of them, clean out print statements, um, look for anywhere where you utilize the for loop where you don't necessarily need one, look for anywhere where a different, um, uh, a different data type might be more efficient. Maybe you're utilizing string where you should be utilizing um, something like a list so that you can merge it later on. Um, maybe you're utilizing something like we just did right now. We we had two for loops nested within each other uh, by, by utilizing a dictionary. We were able to kill one of those for loops and kill one of those iterations to make sure that we had an O of N rather than O of N squared. And as you're working through that, make sure you're explaining, right? Talk out loud. Just like how you see in the program, myself and Adam go through problems and we're just talking. One, we talk about the problem and then we talk about our thought process and then we turn that those thoughts into code. Mimic that same behavior. Make sure you understand the current problem or the current smallest task possible that you're trying to tackle. Say your thought process out loud, write some pseudocode and then turn that pseudocode into code. Walk, work in small, tiny chunks. You want to make sure that you're not trying to bite the whole problem. Look at the smallest problems possible and then move forward. All right. Then finally, you want to talk to the solution together. Once you have something working, explain how you would test that solution. Um, and after you're done with that, be ready to get feedback, right? And feedback is just good feedback. It's always good feedback, regardless of the way it's delivered regardless of the way it's worded. 
Um, you should always be open to any feedback um, and, you know, be open to sharing your opinion in a, in a positive manner to the interviewer. If they tell you something that you don't fully agree with or that you don't fully understand, you know, ask them, well, why is that? I thought that under the hood, this was doing X, Y, and Z. Is there a specific reason why you would like it done in that way? And if so, what would, how would that make this more efficient in big O or in memory analysis or just in general, how would that make this code better? The more questions you have regarding feedback or the more interested you are in their feedback, the better. And if you have enough time, apply it. And if not, then at least you ask the questions to make sure that you fully understand and they see it that you have interest in writing better code. Okay. At this point, we're going to do a little bit of demonstration of how it would look like with a coding interview. Before we do that, I want to make sure I address any questions, and then we take a short break before we start going into the interview process. So at this point, does anyone have any questions over what was covered in today's lectures? Yeah, I have one question, I guess, real quick. When would you advise that we should start utilizing the benefit um, that we have for this class for the interviewing? Should we just try to do that immediately? Or because I know personally, I just felt a little under prepared because, well, there's quite a bit to it, but I didn't know if maybe just go ahead and say go for it or what's your advice on that? Yeah, definitely. And that's a great question. So this um this evening for stand down we'll be covering PRAMP, how to utilize that platform, some of the benefits of that platform. And uh we would expect you guys to start utilizing it after today. But right? once now that we covered data structures and algorithms, we're at the point where we can start writing good and efficient code and actually having uh communicate com conversations, sorry, conversations about code. Um, so we'll be covering that today. And then once we cover that material, we recommend that you start using it the sooner the better. Does that answer your question, Michael? Makes sense. And it's one of those things probably just like coding. The more you do it, the better you get. So why not start now? Exactly. Exposure. Okay. There are no other questions. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Uh, currently it is 1040. Let's come back at 1050 and go into an example of an interview. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Francisco, hello, sir. Hey, Adam, how's it going? Going great. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to interview today with Megacorp. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. And, you know, likewise, thank you so much for giving me some time today. I'm sure you have a lot of other things to get done in your busy day. This is, I, I appreciate that. Honestly, this is great though. We always are looking for good people. Um, and I see you've already pulled up the problem we're going to work on, which is awesome. And so we've got an hour to uh, work on this together and get a solution together and then maybe talk a bit about it. And, um, Feel free to ask me any questions you might normally, you know, Google or or use ChatGPT or anything like that. And and to be honest, we can always use Google for for minor language feature things. I'm not too worried about that. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at this problem and um, dive on in. Okay, awesome. So the problem says it's uh, sorting a list. Given the head of a linked list, return the list after sorting it in ascending order. So example one, we got four, two, one, and three, which turn into one, two, three, four. Uh, in example two, it seems like it includes a negative number where the negative number would be negative one, then five, three, four, and zero, and uh, organizes it to negative one, zero, three, four, and five. Um. And it gives me a pretty good example here as to what the input would look like, where the head is actually demonstrating that the very first value would be negative one, and then the mm -hmm. next would be five and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it also shows me that I should account for an empty list here. Mm -hmm. So it looks like I have to account for negative numbers, empty list. Uh, the number of nodes in the list is in the range of zero to five to the 10 Okay, so it looks like there's quite a bit of numbers as well that I could possibly receive in this <clears throat> in this node. So I would want to make sure that I 
manage that accordingly. And then it gives me the value in which my node could be. So it could be a really large negative value or a really large positive value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I think that's all correct. And and the follow-up about sort of improving the efficiency of the algorithm, um, we can take a look at that if you want uh, once we get a working implementation. Awesome. Yeah, so it seems here that it, it looks like it's asking for a sort of length of ON of log N. Um, I may be wrong, but that kind of gives me a hint that this might be looking for merge sort. Merge sort. Um, so yeah, if you don't mind, I would definitely like to get a working um, working solution first, then afterwards going into looking into merge sort and how that would look. I think that definitely makes sense just to get some code that's working and running and then figure out how to make it more efficient. And, and I think you're correct that some sort of algorithm providing us a bit more efficiency is what we would need to get that like big O of N log N uh, runtime. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so just to clarify, the edge cases here would be where I receive an empty list that I have to handle and where my list uh, may contain negative numbers. Uh, but other than that, I don't really see any other edge cases. It seems like all my values are to be numeric. Um, are there is there anything else that I should be considering or taking into account before thinking about this problem? I think those are those are definitely good edge cases that you identified. Um, maybe the only thing I would throw out there is thinking about if we have to do anything differently in like handling how we work with, say, possibly the very first node in the list or the, possibly the very last one. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you mind if I utilize this tool TL draw to draw out each individual node and draw out my thought process first? Actually, that sounds awesome. Uh, please do. Okay. Let me go ahead and get some squares here with some values. So it looks like four is the first node. And actually, um, let me uh, pause the interviewer hat for a moment. Um, Francisco, do we want, what, 30 minutes? How much time sort of is the mock interview? An hour is good. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Using TL Draw is, is awesome. Let's let's dive in and take a look. Uh, I think it's a great idea to, to kind of go through the process, especially for linked lists before um, actually writing code. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna actually draw this out and utilize a little bit of colors here so I can see pointers and all that good stuff um, to make sure I'm not getting it confused in any way. Yeah, I don't actually know if I've ever had anyone um, use like a TL draw tool during an interview, but actually it's a it's a great idea, um, especially since we can't have a whiteboard like we like we would for if we were in person. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's just uh, something about being able to actually seeing the problem uh, has always helped me interpret code. Same, Ab absolutely. Okay, um, so it looks like I got my link list here as to what it currently looks at. Um, and now if I were to write my code in a way that I would want this to work, I think I would want this to work recursively um, just so that I could start from the tail end of my code rather than starting from the very start. Um, so okay. I'm going to draw this out as if it were recursive. And what I think I would make my base case is if there isn't a dot next. So I think my base case would then return uh, three. Because this should look something along the lines of if um, not had dot next, 
then it should return the node. Return head. And does the problem give us any specific information about what the value of head.next is for the very last node? Um, I believe it gives me next being none here as the default value. Um, so with that said, I think it would be safe to see that the link between four to two would be where dot next is linked all the way together, but with three not having an attached node, it's next would be none. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're correct. Okay. Awesome. All right. So now that it's returning that, when well, I think I could write my code now, um, where I would like to check the values between the node that I'm currently on and the next node and seeing how that changes. So I can say something along the lines of if head.val is greater than head.next.val, then I would want to switch those nodes. Okay. Well, now the question is, what would that look like? I think one and three would return perfectly fine. Uh, so I guess that gives me my other case here where I would just say, if this if statement is not triggered, then I would just want to return the head. All right, because if one is not greater than three, then this is already in ascending order. So I would just want to return one being attached to the head. Um, so that looks like it's working the way I want it to. Doesn't seem like I need to change anything. Uh, but here, oh, and I apologize. Looks like I missed my bridges. And is the head, is that the same thing as sort of like the, the current or the index, the thing pointing to the, the current node that we're looking at as we move through the list? Yes, I think uh, the way I'm thinking about this is this first column uh, would always be representing my head. Um, which I will likely call Got it. once I start writing it. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the clarification. And I, I apologize if I had any confusion there. I, I think you're right that once we start writing code, I'll be able to follow along just fine. Okay. Well, now I can see that this if statement would get triggered. So I think I can, I'm at the point where I can envelope on this code a little bit and uh, write what that would look like. Well, I think I would want my current to be equal to head. And I would want my next to be equal to head.next. Um, and I believe that would say that is current and this would be my next head. Yep. And honestly, using the, the TL draw here is incredibly helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now that I have this information, well, I can change the the next variable of each one. So I could tell current dot next to be equal to next head dot next. And what this would do is move the bridge from two to one to be from two to three. And then what I can do after that is I can then reattach one because right now one is lost. Well, I can reattach one by saying next head is equal to current. Okay, and then once I make that switch, well, now I can return head. And actually, as long as we're looking at this code, um, I think you have the right logic 
are we sure that we want to set next head to current? If you look at what you're doing um, on the line above, you do slight, something slightly different. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I it seemed to be changing the the actual value of the variable rather than its attribute yes. next. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Yes. Exactly. I knew I knew that you knew where it was going. Thank you. So now that I made that switch, well, I know originally I had a return head here, but I wouldn't want to return the head. Instead, I would want to return the next head. And by returning the next head, well, what I would be doing is I would essentially be returning where I would be returning one. Two. Mm -hmm. And then two would be attached to three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so does this mean that we do an extra comparison of of one and two again of those same nodes? Ooh, that's that's a good question. Yeah, because now although I evaluated these two, when did I ever evaluate if two and three were greater? Right. And I'm I'm assuming you'll recurse and iterate through. Um I'm also seeing, hey, we figured out one and two, but um well actually you know what I, I I apologize. I should pause and I think I'll hold my thoughts till we get an implementation working. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I might be getting a little confused here. I think I think we're on the right path. I think I may see the problem a little clearer when I move down to this four up here. Because now <clears throat> when I run my code, this four and this three will switch places. I mean, this four and this one will switch places. Um, but after this four and this one switch places, well, now what I return isn't an organized list. It's actually one, four, and two. So if I'm accounting for something that's way to the left, having to shift all the way to the right, it looks like I would need to iterate through the heads themselves regardless. Um, so maybe the statement here is incorrect or not necessarily incorrect, but maybe I need to walk my head. So rather than having... Yeah. Oh. oh, I was going to say I'm not 100%. Um, but what do we, what do we want to do if head dot val is not greater than head dot next dot val? It would what just, like... oh yeah, please. Yeah. If we, if it wasn't greater, it would just return the head. I think we saw that example up here where one isn't greater than three. So it just returned one and three. I think that if I am understanding how you want to implement this, we may need a point at which the algorithm moves on to the next item in the list. And I think you're correct about that. And I think there's probably a couple different ways to implement it. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. I was thinking that maybe we could do a while loop that would walk through the heads. And as long as the head exists and it's not equal to none, then we could continue moving forward. Um, so if I were to write that in code, I would say while head 
and I guess I should check if head.next also exists and head.next. Then I can say if head and rather than returning this, I would want head is equal to next head. Okay, so now if I were to start from the very beginning all over again, so it's going to say while the head exists and head.next exists, and then it's going to ask this if statement, if one is greater than three, well, that won't get triggered. So then it's going to walk the head to the next one. And I'm actually going to utilize a, a shape here instead to be able to see this. So currently I check one mm -hmm. and three. So that won't get triggered. So the head will move over to three. But then it'll say while head and head.next. Well, head.next is none. So it'll break out of the while loop and return the head. Um, but I just switched the value of the head here to be next head. Hmm. Would it be a good idea to set an outside variable named original head and make that equal to the current head of the function? That way it always keeps track of the original head. I think that could be useful. I think for me, I might want to see some code and, and print statements that we could walk through this. I do want to say, I think even without the while loop, what if when the head is, when we don't need to make a switch, um, if that's the point at which we move on to the next, to the next one. Um, so you're saying that as soon as we don't need to make a switch, then we should return the, the original head immediately with, or, well, if we look at your if statement, and I think the logic is spot on here where we're comparing, um, let's say which, uh, which one of these um, should we use to kind of walk through the algorithm? The one on the bottom or which one would be uh, easiest? Yeah, I think this one would be good. Right? Yeah. Would so I think this looks great because like we had one, four, two, three. And you said, hey, if head.val is greater than head.next.val, and the head was originally set to one, right? If we look at the one at the very bottom, um, the one, four, two, three, which is the original arrangement, you're like, all right, hey, we need to switch nodes here. Um, I'm gonna set current to head. I'm gonna set my next head to four. And, um, and then I'm going to set, um, I'm so sorry. I got myself confused. Please forgive me. We had four, one, two, three, and we reversed it to one, four, two, three. I'm so sorry. No, so no. to reiterate, we had the four. We realized the one needs to go before the four. We did the logic with the heads and the pointers to put the one before the four. Um, and then and then we're set. Um, and I think kind of what I'm saying is once we do that and we end up with a uh, one, four, two, three, all the way at the bottom, we compare one and four and say, hey, I don't need to move anything at all. Why don't I just move my head forward from one to four? Got it, okay. And I think I'm also realizing that we may need three pointers rather than just two. So I may need to keep track of previous, current, and next head. Um, if you don't mind, is it okay for me to start writing some code just so I could start seeing it compile and uh, go leak? for it? Yeah, I I feel similarly. I think this is really helpful, and also because I can tell, like I might be making some bad assumptions around how you intend to implement the code, too. Because I think 
like some of the nitty gritty of what we're getting into now depends a bit on like what we're returning and how that return statement is used, especially if if the intent is to do this recursively. All right, so it looks like my base case will be first. So I'm gonna check if not head dot next, then I would want to return the head. And then otherwise head dot next would be equal to the function where I would say self dot sort list and I would pass in the next node. And that should then recursively call my function. So I'm gonna go ahead and print um self dot value say again or sorry i was i see yeah you want to print the head yeah yeah you might want to print head dot value i don't know if leak code has given us a like a dunder string method or anything um i actually wanted to see the entire like connection of the head rather than just okay. the value. um but I guess you're right, since we're not changing anything for now, it would be great to see that. So let's see what happens here. Okay, so it looks like it runs into a non-type error. Um, so if not head.next, return head. Hmm. So it looks like this head dot next isn't necessarily working. Um, if maybe I could do something if head dot next is equal to none instead. And then first, I just want to check that this runs. Let's uh, maybe look at which test case. Yeah, it looks like I'm running it against the first test case. Um, oh, but I should account for an empty list as well. So if the list is empty, then it would never had a dot next. So I, I was wondering something about that, but it does look like the test case has stuff in it. I will admit with leak code, I always get a little confused around like calling um, the method that they give us recursively. I don't know if that's what's causing the issue here. Um, Okay, if not head, and I guess this should be an or. Uh, remind me again, is head, is head a list? Is it an instance of the list node class? What is, what is head again? So head would be an instance of the, of the list node class. And Got it. I think the edge case that I'm running into is where the head would be empty. So I would assume that after running this first portion saying, if not head, so if the head doesn't exist, then it would return head. But it seems like it's also evaluating the right-hand side. Um, You could try an... Hmm. Do you think maybe it's something with my comparisons? I think that, yeah, let's just try. We can try that. I think that should work. I don't know if we need both of those or statements, uh, but that does seem to be working now. Okay. My, yeah. All right, so that accounted for the first edge case. And let me go ahead and print head now.
one eye can see four. There we go. Two and one. So that's the first iteration. And then we can see it happening recursively where it returns three and none. Then it returns um, two, one, and three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can see the recursive value now not working. Okay. Awesome. So this seems to be working correctly as far as recursion goes. And now I can go ahead and move into the next portion, which is evaluating what happens if the list is greater than the number to the right. So I'm going to go ahead and make this while loop here. OK. And I'm going to say that while there's three nodes still existing, because I'm going to do three pointers, I'm going to say previous node is equal to head. The next or current node is equal to head dot next. And the next node is equal to head dot next dot next. And that should give me three um three separate nodes, each pointing at each other. So now I could run my evaluation. Um I do have one question actually. Yeah, of course. Is your base case on line eight going to let us get to I see. Okay. I was a little worried the base case because it's checking basically if the last node doesn't exist or if the last node really is the last node, if the head is the last node or not, mm -hmm. if that would let us get into a bad state with the while loop. But I think we might have a little extra logic, but it's not a big deal. I think with the while statement, you've got that while head dot next dot next. And that's always going to make sure that, as you said, there's at least three things. So ignore me. I think you're you're good. Awesome. So I think the first thing that I would want to check is my next and current. So I could say if current dot val is greater than next dot val, then I would want current dot next to be equal to the next dot next node. So that would change the bridge there. And then I would want the next node of next to be equal to current. And then the same thing could be said for previous. So then I can check if previous is greater than and now in this case Ooh, I think I would also want to rename these now. So now I would change this to current is equal to NXT. I did have one question about that first if statement. Yeah, of course. Do we need to do anything with previous? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then previous dot next would be equal to next yeah totally thank you because then that would link that would yeah. link together and now i think now i think you're set because and if i walk through it just to make sure i'm tracking correctly our our current is i don't know 50 and next is five so we want to move the current one ahead and you do that with uh, setting it to next dot next on line 16. Mm -hmm. um, and then on line 17, we have next point to the current one. So we point five to 50. So we move it back. And then you finally connect whatever was before to um, to the next to next. So I think that's I think that's looking good. Right. So this would um 
This would be something like if four is greater than two, then the bridge would go to three. The bridge of two would then move to four and then previous being one would move to two. Okay, so that's what we have there. Um, and I guess I wouldn't have to check if previous is now greater than current. I don't think you have to now. Okay. Uh, although you do raise a good point. Does this work if we look at the um, example of 4213? What are the values for previous, current, and head? Yeah. So if I were to take 4213, well, I know that would be previous. Or sorry, it might be better for me to write it out. So here's, and actually it would start off backwards. So it would likely start off here because we're doing recursively. So it would start off with previous, current, and head, and next. So Why would it start there? Um, because we're working recursively. So the first nodes that we would get in our call stack where it would trigger my if statement of while.next.next .next .next would be uh, this row down here. Oh, I see. All right, so if it um, starts there, it would evaluate if, if current is greater than next, which it isn't. Okay. And then assuming that it moves on to the next call stack, it would then move these as such where previous is four, current is two, and next is one. And we handle here moving mm -hmm. yep. that there and also moving here. Uh, but now the problem is I also need to evaluate previous. Yeah. Next. And that's what I was wondering about if the current implementation of the code would catch the, the scenario where the very first item in the list needs to be shifted. Got it. Okay. So this is this is what I currently have, right? So now let's if I could make another if statement where Yeah. I think I misspoke before when you're asking, should we check previous as well? Right. Yeah, right. there's a couple of ways to implement this, but I think this this way makes sense with what we have. Okay, so now I'm checking if previous.val is greater than previous.next.val. So now I'm just going to remake that variable again, where previous is equal to previous.next. Okay, and now I can attach four to the next one, which would be previous.next is equal to nxt dot next and then next dot next is equal to previous so after it makes that switch it would then check if four is greater than one and it would switch it and reattach the nodes accordingly and then 
after that, I guess I would want to walk the head, right? So now I could say mm -hmm. yeah. head is equal to head dot next. And now after walking the head, well, now I would take uh, wherefore would still be previous, but now it would be attached to two and it would repeat the process. So the first if statement wouldn't be triggered. The second one would. And could you actually show me, and this may be my own, I may have missed something. How does the walking of the head relate to when we recurse, if at all? Um, I don't think it does. Um, it doesn't in this in this example because the if statement doesn't get triggered until way later. Um, but if it was a larger example, um, then it would essentially organize the smallest part of the list first before. Do, do we need to both walk the head with the while loop and recurse? And I'm not 100% on this, to be honest, but I, I do want to check in on that. Um, Maybe recursion isn't necessary if we're going about solving it this way. I think that we only need one. I think with the while loop and walking the head, we don't need to recurse. On the other hand, if we did recurse, I think the point that you made before about how the recursion, like we'll do all our recursive calls till we hit our base case and we get to the end. And then as each one resolves, it kind of moves back. I think that would do the job of moving through the list for us. I'm looking at the different heads, but I'm not a hundred percent. If that, did that make sense? I think it, I think it does. Yes. Let me go ahead yeah. and and run this real quick and then just to check in on time i think i still have 20 minutes is that right yeah we're actually doing quite well on time um i think we started about 10 10 till the hour so you've got 20 somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes um and we're making pretty good progress overall and, and digging into this in a good way um and having a good discussion and i and to be totally honest i haven't looked at linked lists in, in a little while as well so this is so thank you for being patient with me as we dig into this. Ah, so interesting. We ran into the the none type error. Yeah, and I'm assuming it has to do with this. So I already handled if the list was empty. And uh, I can't handle this part anymore. I do see what's going on here. So because we're not recursing, we only hit that if statement once. So I would have thought that the while statement would have handled that inside the while loop, but maybe for the input where there is nothing in there. Um, I'm not actually a hundred percent. So if I'm saying if had dot next dot next is not none continue moving forward well what if it doesn't have that okay so Okay, so it seems like that handled it. And now if I take a look here, we can see that I have my output. It looks like it only iterated through this head.next once, where I have four, two, one, and oh no, it looks like it only did it once. Hmm. Where is, uh, if you don't mind showing me the print statement again? 
Uh, the print statement is at the very beginning of the while loop. I see. So we got, so it prints, that print statement prints twice, if I'm correctly reading. Uh, no, it only prints once. It's actually wrapping. Oh, it's wrapping. I see. Uh, thank you. Interesting. I think it may be because of this, this line here. Yeah, I think that So this that makes sense to me because the way we have the logic in the while loop, we do need the three things. We need head, head.next, and head.next.next. .next. Otherwise we we air out. Um you think it would still error out rather than just return none here? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, you're correct. I, I apologize. That next would just be set to none. Though then next.val, as you're seeing, yeah, that, that could be throwing an error. Okay. So it looks like that might have walked it a little bit. So now we see four, two, and one. And then when it walks it to head.next, it looks like the next head would be two and three. But then it returns none. So I don't think we're going about this the right way, unfortunately. Um, I hope I didn't inadvertently lead us down a wrong path by going with the while loop instead of recursion. But I think that the logic the basic logic that we have seems about right. Can we maybe run this for some really simple test cases, if that would help us in debugging? Yeah, of course. Uh, let me go ahead and go into test cases. Um, maybe I want to do something like one and two. See what that yeah. does. I think that's a good call. So here, part of the issue actually might be if you look at the output versus expected output, and then look at what is our function returning, actually. Yeah, no, I, I understand that my function is not returning anything right now. So I could do something like... And then uh, outside of the while loop, return head. Um, the previous is equal to original. And then I want original. And that is what we call that as an edge case to be aware of. And then do we want to return head or original head on line 28? Oh, thank you so much. Totally. So if I were to run through this, okay, it gives me test case one and two. Yeah, if so I this is a solid start. And now what if we do two, one? Yeah. No. Or two, one. <laughs> yeah. Because I feel like you pretty much have it. Like, we pretty much have it. There's just probably one small thing that we're missing here. Interesting. So it looks like if I run 2, 1, it gives me a none type error in dot next. So while head. I'm not sure as to why it would give me that if it would kill it after checking the next head. Uh, I wonder, 
So what may be going on here is if we, do we have any print statements in standard out or did the runtime error eliminate those? We do. We have the first print statement of two and one. Um, and does that tell us that it iterated through the list once? Oh, I think it's the way that I'm walking my list. Yeah, I think, and and to be fair, we I, I think with the original sort of recursive implementation, it made sense. I think what's going on here is um, we go through the first thing in the list fine, and we move on to the second, and then, well, Actually, I would have expected it. It should exit out. Shouldn't it, we shouldn't even get into the list the second time? Oh well, when we're at the second, no. Actually, I'm not a hundred percent. If let me pause because I want to make sure I'm not causing confusion. Let's see. I will want head to be equal to. current, because I wouldn't want it to check multiple values in there. And then in this case, I would want the head um, to be equal to previous. And I believe that would walk my head correctly. Okay. Uh, you actually explained the head equal to previous to me. I might I might be missing something there. Yeah, of course. So we switch next and previous values, right? Um, and by switching them, well, when I walk my head, I will want my head to now be aiming at previous or aiming at itself again. So technically, I wouldn't have to walk it in this case. Um, but in the case that it is the original head, I, I think I would want to make it previous just in case. Um, this way, it looks at that list and then when it starts to while loop all over again. Okay. I I'm going to check it to see what happens if I put it with three, two, and one. Okay, so it looks like it cut out one of my values. So this is progress though. And it tells us that the logic somewhere in that reassignment. Yeah, I think adding some print statements is a good idea. Um, we are coming close on time, but we're also almost done, I think. So let's see if we can take a couple minutes and, and, and knock this out. Okay, I think our problem is happening here. Oh, sorry, in here. So I'm aiming my next is equal to previous. My previous dot next is now aiming at that next. I wonder, so, If next is, I wonder if those lines need to be flipped, but I'm not actually 100%. What do you think? Um, I don't think so. Um, let me go ahead and check this real quick. Um, so previous is greater than two, right? So then it would say, okay, well now next is equal to previous dot next. So here is next and previous is currently aiming at three. And after that, I tell it, 
that previous dot next is equal to the next of next. So now. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We'll be aiming at one. Yeah, you're right. Right, and then next dot next would be aiming at previous. Okay, so then it switches those two. And then when it walks my head, I'm saying head is equal to previous. So now head is equal to three. And, and what was the that if statement that we had in there again? Uh, if this one? Yeah, okay. Oh, if previous equals original head, original head equals next, which just is, walks us forward. Right, so now original head is aiming at two. Okay, so when it runs through this algorithm again, it checks if current is greater than next, which it is. And actually, if I'm looking at my return, it looks like it's only returning one and three. So that might be the problem. Um, so previous is now aiming at two. Current is aiming at three, and next is aiming at one. Okay. So now I say, oh, no, it's not, actually. So here it is. Here's the problem. I'm walking it to previous rather than walking it to next. Uh, I apologize. I think I was wondering, but I wasn't tracking there you go okay awesome so now let me go ahead and try one of these let's see if that does the the test case here Uh, let's just try commenting out that print statement. Oh, was it an output? No. I think that's I think that's what's causing it because we're doing a lot of of looping. Yeah, which may indicate maybe there's we're not exiting when we should actually, but we'll we'll see in just a minute. Yeah, it looks like it exceeded exceeded the time limit for two four two and one. And maybe because I'm walking to current here again. I think that, let's see, which case is that for? For the current is greater than next. Right. And did we end up reassigning? We did all the reassignments. So we probably do want to walk forward to head next, I think. I'm not honestly 100%, but I think that's a reasonable assumption. And let's give it a shot. And then we might have to call it because we're we're pretty much at time. Okay. Let me go ahead and run that real quick. Oh, it seems like it's exceeding my time limit. Oh, that's unfortunate. I feel like we're quite close here. Um, I have to say, though, it was really clear that you had like kind of a strong understanding of the basic mechanics of how to go through a linked list and the things to be aware of when we were sort of diagramming it out in TL draw, which was awesome. And I think it was just maybe in the implementation phase, sort of deciding between recursions and, and while loops. Um, and, and I apologize too, if I contributed to that. And also I think like if we jump back to the TL draw code for a moment, 
And if we go to where you wrote out the code sort of for the original implementation of the algorithm, uh, it might have been down a bit. There it is. Yeah. I think this, you know, aside from the question of exactly the, the details of the while loop and what to return, I think the logic here is solid. Um, and the one difference here being we didn't need to use a previous because I think at some point you do like a next dot next uh, um, or you do current next. And I don't know if that maybe caused some confusion in the implementation phase as well, but that is one thing that caught my eye. Interesting. Yeah, I'm actually wondering if this is happening because I'm not walking the head if either of these if statements are triggered. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to run this just in case. Yeah, let's do it. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we can't get this working. Okay, so that got it working. It's still not working properly, but it, it got it working now to where I can see four, one, two, and three. Um, I just, uh, what was the change you made again? Um, I turned this if into an elif. Um, that makes sense. That that makes a lot of sense, I, I think. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. Um, okay, so it's it's walking now. It's just not all the way just there yet, but. Yeah, well, what happened was I wasn't walking my head if either of these if statements were being triggered. Right, I see what you're saying. You're totally right. Um, and in fact, I wonder if you need to walk the head inside either of the if statements at, at all, though I'm not sure that we should change change stuff um yeah of course if you don't mind i would like to keep working on this and then once i come up with the solution to share my solution with you um do you mind sharing your contact information with me and then i could email this your way by any chance yeah absolutely i would love to um and i very much enjoyed working through the problem together um even though we didn't get to a solution like it, you know it's clear you have a pretty strong understanding of this and to be honest i haven't looked at Link, there's maybe a bit of, of stuff with link lists I need to bone up on as well. Uh, but like using the TL draw was was awesome and, and walking through it was great. And and it's clear that you have like a, a strong understanding of the problem and you're comfortable with, with Python. So um, th thank you very much. Uh, it was great talking with you. And um, I'd be happy to answer any follow-up questions you might have by email just because we just did end up running a bit long and we'll reach out soon about next steps. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll definitely be reaching out. Have a good afternoon. You too. All right. Hats off. Uh, Hats off. <laughs> uh, thank you so Stop much it. for watching me struggle through that. Um, does anyone have any questions about the interview or what myself or Adam did or how we went about it? Natalie? Um, is it always like that collaborative? Um, or do sometimes do they like leave you to do it your own? Like most of the time, because right now it seemed like you guys were doing like a lot of uh, pair programming almost like working together. Is that usual? Um, so from my experience, uh, yes, it's about that collaborative. Um, especially during the first technical interview. Uh, if you get to like the final rounds and you have a technical interview, then they might just leave you uh, out there hang, uh, hanging dry. Uh, but that's just because at that point, they're really trying to see who can get the furthest into the coding interview as possible. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Yeah, thank you. And then Adam, do you have to share the same experience? I, I agree. That's my experience as well. I maybe it will depend a bit on the interviewer, um, but in general, and I maybe was a bit more on the collaborative side, maybe because, you know, we work together and it's not a real interview, but um, 
I was not like out of line. Like in general, while every now and then you might get an interviewer that's just like a, a like a, a cold fish, so to speak. Like, you know, every now and then I would point out like minor things. Um, and that's really normal. Like people know folks are anxious during interviews and no one's trying to like trip you up on technicalities. And like if an interviewer sees that a candidate like has a pretty good understanding of stuff, they'll try to kind of help them out and and move forward. Um, if anything, I think I was a bit underprepared as an interviewer for this. And, and if anything, uh, in a real interview, the interviewer might have done a better job of guiding Francisco onto um, like the right path, so to speak, that we were we were awfully close. But yeah, they're they're pretty collaborative. Awesome. Um, and honestly, that that's what you want. Like the more the better. Like if I was an interviewer, like the fact that I know how this person works, that they can communicate well, that we can have a good back and forth where they're able to listen to advice I have, but also able to understand things well enough themselves to say like, hey, actually, I think this is correct or like you might not be right here um, is, you know, kind of what the interviewer is is looking for. Um, so while ideally, yes, you get to a solution within the allotted time, it's not necessary. And truth be told, I, we almost had that solution done in TL draw. I, I really think the only piece that was missing was maybe thinking through the recursive element or the while loop. Um, and I'll just pause there because I'm, I'm rambling on a bit, but yeah, great, great question. Awesome. Yeah. What other questions do folks have? Um, it's not really a question. I just, um, I appreciated that you were able to demonstrate um, what, like how you would wrap up an interview, like if you weren't able to like finish the code or get the code to work. Um, is that usually taken like, is it like if you weren't able to get it to work, but you did wrap it that way and you did follow up, is that still considered a positive end to an interview, a technical interview usually? Um, I would say so. Definitely. I def I've had a lot of interviews where I couldn't get to the the correct answer in time and I would give them that. And then I would either share share a repository or send in my my answer to some sort of um email. And usually that actually got me into the next follow on steps. Um I'm not sure if it was necessarily that specific action that got me into the next follow on steps or anything else in the interview process. Um, but I would say that it shows that you know, it shows a little bit of tenacity, like, sure, I didn't make it now, but I will give you an answer. Even if I'm out of the running, you're going to get my answer, whether you like it or not. Does that answer your question, Kara? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Of course. Adam? Yeah, just to add to that, um, there was one job where I did not pass the take-home interview, like the take-home project. I made it way too complicated. And I got so pissed at myself that I just redid it again and sent it in. And then they were like, okay, well, let's take you in for the next interview because you took like the time and effort to do this. Um, and kind of to add on to what Francisco was saying, um, you know, like if the interviewer sees that you understand the problem and are able to like get to like 80% of the solution and understand it well, and Francisco demonstrated that he understood both the problem and the solution really in the first 20 something minutes in TL draw. Um, and we were struggling with like implementation issues, um, which was a bit on me as the interviewer, though, of course, as it's an interviewer, it's both. Um, but also like Francisco got code running and working. We got code working for the simple use cases. Um, like if at the end of this, we had a bunch of code that did not run at all for anything and just produced a bunch of bugs, I think that would have been a different situation. Um, like as long, cause they wanna see understanding, they wanna see communication, and then they wanna see that you have an ability to like write code that works in a limited amount of time. Cause that's just such a core software engineering skill. So yeah, ideally we finished the problem, but really we ticked an awful lot of the boxes here. Like, you know, I I would definitely like have moved this candidate on to the next round. 
Um, and I think that would be true for a lot of a lot of places. Awesome. Any other questions? Okay, great. If there are no questions, that's going to conclude our lecture. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.